Hello everyone and welcome to Uncivil Law, where we learn through the misfortunes of others. If you're enjoying this legal education content, please remember to subscribe. It helps the channel grow. For today's case, we're dealing with the compelled use of pronouns as it relates to transgendered students. This is the case of Nicholas Merriweather versus Shawnee State University and the Sexuality and Gender Acceptance Alliance. In this case, a university tried to force professors to call students by their preferred pronouns. One of the professors objected and was disciplined for not using the correct pronoun. So in today's discussion from the Sixth Circuit, we're gonna learn whether or not a university can force a professor to use the student's preferred pr pronouns. In absolutely no way controversial, let's get started with this. Nicholas Merriweather is a philosophy professor at Shawnee State University a small public college in Portsmouth, Ohio. Shawnee State began awarding bachelor's degrees just 30 years ago. Professor Merriweth is also a devout Christian. He strives to live out his faith each day. And like many people of faith, his religious convictions influence how he thinks about human nature, marriage, gender, sexuality, morality, politics, and social issues. At the start of the school year, Shawnee State emailed the faculty informing them that they had to refer to students by their preferred pronouns. Merriweather asked university officials for more details about the policy, and officials confirmed that professors would be disciplined if they refused to use a pronoun that reflects a student's self-identified gender identity. What if a professor had moral or religious objections? That didn't matter. The policy applied regardless of professors' convictions or views on the subjects. When Merriweather asked to see the revised policy, university officials pointed him to the school's already existing policy that prohibited discrimination because of gender identity. So the university had a policy that prohibits discrimination on the basis of gender identity, and they have expanded this without changing the language to also include pronouns. So they're trying to force this philosophy professor who is a Christian to use pronouns that he doesn't believe in. So good times. Let's read some more. Mary Weather approached the chair of his department, Jennifer Pauly, to discuss his concerns about these newly announced rules. Pauly was derisive and scornful. Knowing that Mary Weather had successfully taught courses on Christianity thought throughout the decades, she stated that Christians are primarily motivated out of fear and should be banned from teaching courses regarding religion. In her view, even the presence of religion in higher education is counterproductive. You know, not to put too fine a point on it here, to chair of the department, Jennifer Pauly, uh, when it comes to presence of religion in higher education. But I would be remiss if I didn't point out that Harvard University is the oldest education, oldest higher education college in the United States. Anyone want to take a guess as to what Harvard University was created to study? Anyone want to take any guesses as to what its original purpose was? Y yeah, yeah. So saying that presence of religion in higher education is counterproductive, you know, there, there's that. So, yeah. Merriweather continued to teach his students without incident until January of 2018. On the first day of class, Merriweather was using the Socratic method to lead discussions in his course on political philosophy. When using the Socratic method, he addresses students as Mr. or Mrs. Apologies, Miss. He believes the formal nature of addressing students helps them view academic enterprise as a serious, weighty endeavor and fosters an atmosphere of seriousness and mutual respect. In the first class, one of the students Merriweather called on was Doe. According to Merriweather, no one would have assumed that Doe was female based on Doe's outward appearances. So Merriweather, Merriweather over here made the cardinal sin of assuming Doe's gender. Thus, Merriweather responded to a question from Doe by saying, Yes, sir. Da, da, da. So yeah, this this student Doe, who who Merriweather says doesn't appear to be female, uh, we called on Doe as part of a cold call, and then we we used the unforgivable sin of saying yes, sir. It must be rectified. Da, da, da. After class, Doe approached Merriweather and demanded that Merriweather refer to Doe as a woman and use feminine titles and pronouns. This was the first time. Merriweather learned that Doe identified as a woman. So Merriweather paused before responding because his sincerely held religious beliefs prevented him from communicating messages about gender identity that he believes are false. 
He explained he wasn't sure if he could comply with those demands. Doe became hostile, circulating around Merriweather at first, and then approaching him in a threatening manner. I guess this means I can call you a CU blank blank. Doe promised that Merriweather would be fired if they didn't give in to Doe's demands. So Doe over here is is the the is a caricature of the conservative concern, basically. Doe is Doe is Doe is the caricature made real. Doe is saying that, you know, you must call me this name. If you don't, you'll be fired. I demand you conform to me. You will use your speech to conform me. It's a caricature made true in the form of Doe. Let's read more. Meriwether reported the incident to senior university officials, including the dean of students and the department chair, Jennifer Pauley, who we remember from before has some uh, thoughts when it comes to Christianity. University officials then informed her uh, that formed their Title IX officer as the incident. So they got the Title IX person involved in this. Officers, officials from the office met with Doe and escalated Doe's complaint to Roberta Milliken, the acting dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. So we got, yeah, we got the dean involved. And we got Title IX involved. That's great. Dean Milliken went to Meriwether's office the next day. She advised him that he could eliminate all sex-based references from expression, so no using of he or she, him or her, Mr. or Miss, and so on. Meriwether pointed out that eliminating pronouns altogether was kind of not pro practical, especially, you know, when teaching. So he proposed a compromise. He would, begin, he would keep using pronouns to address most of the students in class, but he would refer to Doe using only Doe's last name. So I won't use the pronoun, I'll just use her noun. I'll just call her by her proper name. So that solves the problem, right? Dean Milliken accepted this compromise, apparently believing it followed the university's gender inclusive policy. Doe continued to attend and participate in the class, but Doe remained dissatisfied and two weeks into the semester complained to university officials again. So Dean Milliken paid Meriwether another visit. This time she said if Meriwether did not address Doe as a woman, he'd be violating the policy. So yeah, this is not going great. Azeroth K says, what sucks is this kind of overreaction does not help our cause. No, it really doesn't help your cause, Azeroth. And I appreciate you for recognizing it. Because this, as I've said before, this is like the caricature that the conservatives have dreamed up. This is like our concerns made real. You know, we got the forced pronouns. We got this very demanding, very entitled student over here, Doe. We got a professor who's like, well... I can't call them by their preferred pronoun, but what if I just call them by their name? That solves the problem. I can call everyone else by a pronoun. I'll just call them by their name, right? So, you know, and then, uh, you know, not so much. And we're, we're trying to, we're trying to force them, trying to force them. And, and, and if they don't, they compel them. So yeah, no, this is not helping the cause over here. This is a caricature made real. So yeah. Yeah. Jor Jordan Peterson, Jordan Peterson was right. And Jordan Peterson was right. Yeah, it's like, well, compelled nouns, you know. Soon afterward, Meriwether accidentally referred to Doe by using the title Mr. before immediately correcting himself. Around this time, Doe again complained to the university's title nine coordinator and threatened to retain counsel if the university didn't take action. Sounds like a really pleasant person here over Doe. So Dean Milligan once again came to Meriwether's office. She reiterated the earlier demand and threatened disciplinary action if he did not comply. Trying to find common ground, Meriwether asked whether university policy would allow him to use the student's preferred pronoun, but placed a disclaimer in his syllabus, noting that he was doing so under compulsion and setting forth his personal religious beliefs about gender identity. So it's like, okay, I've tried to reach a compromise by saying, I'll just refer to their name. I said, okay, look, I will even, I'll go one step more. All right, I'll go one step more. I'll use their preferred pronoun, but I just want to put a statement in my syllabus saying that I'm doing this because you're making me. All right, I'll, I'll do it, but I just want to make clear that, you know, this is not my speech, right? This isn't what I want to say. If you want me to do it, if it's your speech, fine, but let me make clear it's not my speech. Did the university accept this? Did the university say, okay, great. I mean, after all, it is our policy. So we have no problem with you putting in your syllabus a note that you're doing this because it is our policy. Did the university say that? We're proud of our policy. We're happy to let you know in your syllabus that you're doing this because it's our policy. Did the university say that? Of course they didn't. 
Dean Milliken rejected this option out of hand. She insisted that putting a disclaimer in the syllabus would itself violate the university's gender identity policy. So the policy which prohibits people discriminating on the basis of gender, if the professor put a note that the university's policy is, I must refer to students by their preferred pronoun, which is their policy, very, the very noting of the policy would be discrimination, which sort of implies that the policy itself is discrimination, doesn't it? Like if, if, if merely, if merely mentioning, merely mentioning the policy, merely writing the policy down is itself discriminatory, how's the underlying policy not discriminatory? I'm not sure, but that's what the university came up with. You can't even note that we're making you do it because it's our policy, which we're super, super proud of, but don't ever mention it. Seems contradictory a little bit. As the semester proceeded, Meriwether continued to search for accommodation of his personal and religious views that would satisfy the university, but Shawnee State was not willing to compromise. After Dean's final meeting with Meriwether, she sent him a formal letter reiterating her den, addressed Doe in the same manner as other students who identify themselves as female. Then, just a few days later, and without waiting for a response, Milliken announced that she was initiating a formal investigation, which opposed to what? Because we've already got Title IX involved. Seems pretty formal, but I, I guess we're on double secret probation. She claimed she was doing so because she received another complaint from a student in the class. But actually, no, it wasn't another complaint from a student. It was Doe. It's Doe. It's always Doe. So the dean over here said that Meriwether has two options. Stop using all sex-based pronouns and referring to students, a practical impossibility that would also alter the teaching environment or refer to Doe as female, even though it would violate his religious beliefs. Only these two options. Stop using any sex designations at all or make accommodate her. I, I, no. Dean Milliken referred the matter to the, the, to the Title IX officer. <laughs> Over the coming months, the university's Title IX staff conducted a less than thorough investigation. They interviewed just four witnesses, Meriwether, Doe, and two other transgender students. They did not ask Meriwether to provide any witnesses. Really super investigation over here. They have witnesses and they don't ask Meriwether, do you have any witnesses we should talk? Didn't even bother to ask. And aside from Doe and Meriwether themselves, none of the witnesses testified about any interaction between the two. So apparently, Apparently this 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 interact apparently this was such a big deal in the classroom this was such a big deal in the classroom and disrupted the classroom so much that they couldn't find literally one student who remembered anything about it that's how derisive it was that's how derisive and hate fueled this professor was they couldn't find any other student who was in the class, who's like, oh, I totally remember how it blew up. I totally remember the professor saying those mean things and the whole, it's, it's like, nope. We didn't, the students are like, we have no idea that this is going on. The only people that testify to it are Meriwether and Doe. Couldn't find literally anyone else who has any memory of this. Totally super disruptive, right? Yeah. Shawnee State's Title IX office concluded that Meriwether's disparate treatment of Doe had created a hostile environment in violation of the university's non-discrimination. So hostile, literally no one else could remember it. That's how hostile it was, great. After the Title IX report issued, Dean Milken over here informed Meriwether that she's bringing a formal charge against him under the faculty's collective bargaining agreement. She then issued a report setting forth her findings because Dr. Meriwether repeatedly refused to change the way he addressed Doe in class due to his views on transgender people. And because of the way he treated Doe, was deliberately different than the way he treats others, he's created a hostile working environment for Doe. Provost Jerry Bauer was tasked with reviewing this disciplinary re recommendation before it was imposed. Meriwether wrote the provost a letter stating that he treated Doe exactly the same as he treated all male students. He'd been referring to Doe without pronouns and by Doe's last name as an accommodation, and that Doe's access to educational benefits and opportunities were never justified. Meriwether further explained that he could not use female pronouns to refer to Doe due to his conscious and religious conviction. He asked the provost to allow reasonable minds to differ on this newly emerging cultural issue. Provost, the provost rejected the request, stating that he approved of the recommendations of the formal action. The Shawnee State then placed a written warning in the file. The warning reprimanded Meriwether and directed him to change his ways. He addresses the students to avoid further corrective actions. And what might those be? Suspension without pay and termination. 
So this is going, going super, super well. The Shawnee State Faculty Union, thankfully coming to the rescue, then files a grievance on Meriwether's behalf. It asked the university to vacate the disciplinary action and allowing Meriwether to keep speaking in a manner consistent with his beliefs. So the, 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 the teachers union over here actually has Meriwether's back, which actually is a pleasant surprise. The provost, who has already rejected the claim once, was tasked with deciding that grievance. You get that? So the, the collective bargaining agreement, he has a complaint, and he'd like that complaint to be reviewed. Guess who gets to review it? The very same guy who did the thing in the first place. A union representative, Dr. Chip Perot, joined Meriwether to present the grievance. From the outset, Bauer ex exhibited deep ho 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 hostility. He repeatedly interrupted the representative, made clear he would not discuss academic freedom and religious discrimination aspects of the case, which you know are kind of important, one would think. Maybe academic freedom and religious discrimination aspects are worthy of being discussed, but no, I'm not going to even discuss them. The union representative tried to explain the teachings of Meriwether's church and why Meriwether felt he was compelled to affirm a position at odds with his faith. At one point during the hearing, the provost openly laughed. Indeed, Bauer was so hostile to the union representative, they weren't able to present the grievance. So, perhaps surprising absolutely no one, the person who thought, ah, we should discipline this person, also thinks that they were right in appeal. Okay, well, that's okay. We're talking to the provost. We do have one step of appeal left. We can go to the president, right? We can go to the president of the university. So let's appeal the provost's decision to the president of the university. Wait a second, who's the president of the university again? The next step in the grievance process involved an appeal to the university's president. In a twist of face, the president turned out to be Bauer, who was the provost, who was the guy who implemented the discipline in the same place. I'm gonna appeal this to myself. Shortly after Provost Bauer here denied the grievance, he was appointed the president. Bauer designated two of his representatives, Shawnee State Labor Relations Director and General Counsel, to meet with Meriwether and Perot on his behalf. So, yeah, we've we've appealed the we've appealed for myself to myself to myself. Things are going super well over here at Shawnee State. Great. The officials that the president had appointed to help deal with this issue agreed with the union that the conduct had not created a hostile environment. Great, great. The people who were ha tasked to adjudicate this thing say, you know, there is no hostile environment, which was the very nature of the complaint. That was the very core of it, right? There was a hostile environment. These people say there is no hostile environment. Huzzah! So complaint dismissed? No. They recommended ruling against Meriwether anyway. What? That was, they said, it's not a hostile environment case, even though, you know, it totally was until just now. Instead, it was a differential treatment case. Well, that's neat. The change in theory contradicted the Title IX investigation and Dean Milliken's disciplinary recommendation, which Provost Bauer approved three times, both of which accused Meriwether of violating policy by creating a hostile environment. And even though we agree it's not a hostile environment, we are now saying this is a differential treatment case. Uh-huh. Since the university would not accommodate religious-based racism or sexism, the university said it ought not to accommodate Meriwether's religious beliefs. Uh-huh. Bauer adopted his representative's findings and denied the grievance again. So due process over here at Meriwether University is not going super great. Um, the, 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 the guy who implemented the recommendation, turn provost, turn president, thinks that this guy should be disciplined because it's a hostile environment case. Oh, wait, no, it's not. It's a differential treatment case. Those are the same thing. So, yeah, we're going to keep it in the file, and if you ever do it again, we'll fire, fire you. Okay, great. So let's turn our attention now to federal court and see if it goes any better. Out of options at Shawnee State, Meriwether filed this lawsuit. He alleges the university violated his rights under the Free Speech and Free Exercise Clause of the First Amendment, the Due Process and Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, the Ohio Constitution, and his contract with the university. Universities have historically been fierce guardians of intellectual debate and free speech. Here, Meriwether alleges that Shawnee State's application of its gender identity policy violated the free speech clause of the First Amendment. The district court re rejected this argument and held that the professor's speech in the classroom is never protected by the First Amendment. So brilliant district court over here, because we're on appeal, obviously, brilliant district court over here who says this doesn't violate the First Amendment because a professor's speech in the classroom is never protected by the First Amendment. 
Wow. Okay. Well, that's that's an idea. A professor speech at a university has no First Amendment protection. Okay, let's give that a shot. We, the Court of Appeals, disagree. Under controlling Supreme Court and Sixth Circuit precedent, the First Amendment protects academic speech of university professors. Since Merriweather has plausibly alleged that Shawnee State violated the First Amendment by compelling his speech or silence and casting a pail of orthodoxy over the classroom, his free speech claims may proceed. Yeah, the district court said free speech doesn't exist in the university and the Court of Appeals is like, yeah, it kind of does. Let's start with the basics. Always a good place to start because the university apparently doesn't understand, so let's start from the ground up. The First Amendment protects the right of speech freely and the right to refrain from speaking at all. Thus, the government may not compel affirmance of a belief which the speaker disagrees. When the government tries to do this anyway, it violates a cardinal constitutional command. You can't compel speech. Courts have often recognized that the free speech clause applies at public universities. Thus, the state may not act as though professors or students shed their constitutional rights to freedom of speech or expression at the university gate. This, this was at the schoolhouse gate, actually in the original, which dealt with a high school. That's tinker, right? So if it applies at a high school, probably applies all the more at the university. To be sure, free speech rules apply differently when the government is doing the speaking. And that remains true even when the government employee is doing the talking. Thus, in Garcetti, the Supreme Court held that normally, when public employees make statements pursuant to official duties, the employees are not speaking as citizens for the First Amendment purposes, and Constitution does not insulate their communication from employer discipline. While this should sound vaguely familiar, we have covered this before, and a couple times, as it applies to police officers, who apparently have gotten in trouble for this, for reporting things that their employer did not want to, right? So we've covered this a couple times, where there's a difference between an individual speech and a government speech. The government, like the individual, can control its speech, and like the individual, the government not, cannot be forced to speak, or it cannot be prohibited in speaking. So the government can choose to speak or not, and it cannot be compelled, just like the individual. So if it's the government speech, then, you know, so be it. If it's the individual speech, so be it. So normally, a public employee is speaking as the government. So it's not normally the government speech, but that's normally, normally. This would be what we call the exception that proves the rule. So let's read some more. Garcetti set forth a general rule regarding government speech, but expressly on its own terms declined to address whether it would apply to a case involving speech regarding scholarship or teaching. So the Supreme Court said, ah, normally you can compel a government speaker to speak because it's the government speech. You're there under your employee. But we're not deciding this relating to universities. Kind of an important detail. Although Garcetti declined to address the question, we can turn to Supreme Court guidance these decisions have long recognized that given the importance of public education and expansive freedom of speech and thought associated with the university environment, universities occupy a special niche in our constitutional tradition. So yeah, the, the, the university is special, kind of like the home, I guess, but the university is not a home. I want to make that very clear to the, to the whiny crybabies at Yale and, you know, for, for that thing that going back a while now, where they say, they literally said, uh, where the teacher said, or the dean said, literally, that you, the university is a place for institutionalized learning. And, she, and the student says, no, it's not. It's not a place for, for, for institutionalized learning. It's a home. That's going back a while. That's dealing with the, um, that's dealing with the Halloween costume controversy, I think, two or three years ago. So, yeah, anyways, old case. But, yeah, so the university is not a home. But it's like the home and being special. So university professors are not your typical government employee. They're, they're providing... They're providing teaching and higher education teaching, right? So there's First Amendment considerations there. So, yeah. As a result, our court has rejected as totally unpersuasive the argument that teachers have no First Amendment rights when teaching or that the government can censor teacher speech without restriction. No. Simply put, professors at public universities retain First Amendment protections at least when engaged in core academic functions such as teaching and scholarship like this. And in addition to us saying it, we have three circuits also telling us, fourth, fifth, and ninth. So, you know, yeah, um, professors at universities, the First Amendment does apply. One final point worth considering, if professors, let me do that again, that was the wrong tone. There's also one final point worth considering. If it was true that professors lacked free speech protections when teaching, you know, as the district court said, a university would wield alarming power to compel ideological conformity. 
a university president could compel a pacifist to declare war is just, a civil rights icon to condemn the Freedom Riders, a believer to deny the existence of God, or a Soviet emerge to address his students as comrades. This cannot be. If there's any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it can be that no official higher petty can prescribe this orthodoxy. So yeah, if, if it was true that, you, that these professors had no First Amendment protection, then it would apply that the university could compel all kinds of speech, and that would be a problem. Well, the university over here isn't so super happy about this uh, line of reasoning, so they have some counter arguments they'd like to raise about why they totally have the right to make university professors use the pronouns that a student wants. So let's see what the university has in, in counterbalance, okay? Shawnee State and the interveners reign several arguments. First, they suggest we ought not to apply Supreme Court academic freedom cases that preceded Garcetti. We shouldn't apply the prior cases because Garcetti, but Garcetti itself said it wasn't dealing with teaching and scholarship. So why shouldn't we apply them? I don't know. It's our job as lower courts is to apply existing Supreme Court precedent unless of a rule. Garcetti very clearly expressed no view on this issue and even recognized that expression related to classroom instruction might not fit within the customary employee speech jurisprudence. So, you know, yeah, I don't know why we wouldn't do this. Second, they would argue, even if there was an academic freedom exception to Garcetti, it does not pr protect Meriwether's use of titles and pronouns in the classroom. Okay. As they would have it, the use of pronouns has nothing to do with academic freedom interests in the substance of instruction. Pro pronouns have nothing to do with academic freedom. I, I would like to take special note at this point that this is a philosophy class. So, there is that. This is not true. Any teacher will tell you that choices about how to lead a classroom discussion shape the content of the instruction. This is especially so because the choices touch on gender identity, a hotly contested matter of public concern that, you know, comes up in a philosophy class. It's a political philosophy class. It's a political philosophy class. Well, gee whiz. Would the issue of gender identity come up in a political philosophy class? Would it be material to the scholastic teaching of a political philosophy class on whether or not should we force this person to use pronouns in a political philosophy class? That has nothing to do with education. Uh-huh. That's, yeah, no. By forbidding Meriwether from describing his views on gender identity, even in his syllabus, which you remember was a compromise, I'll use the pronouns, but you know, let me make it clear this is your policy, which the university for some reason doesn't want to know. They don't want to make clear their policy. It's the university's policy, but we don't want you mentioning it. So Shawnee State silenced a viewpoint that could have catalyzed robust and insightful in-class discussion. Well, yeah, that might be relevant in a political philosophy class. Maybe if the professor says, I won't do this, maybe that might, you know, be relevant to discussions. Under the First Amendment, the mere discussion of ideas is not a problem. And this is personally my personal favorite part of this opinion because it seems to me, your friend on civil law, that some of my brethren on the left sometimes fail to see how the policies they advocate for will eventually come to bite them in the ass. They, they see only the upsides of the policies they argue. So their, their philosophy is, as expressed here, at least in this case, is this this teacher has no freedom of speech and pronouns have nothing to do with academic freedom. They have nothing to do with teaching. Okay, let's apply that philosophy all the way through. How would that come out if that was the rule? So let's, you know, look at how that comes out negatively. So if this was true, it would mean this position would go both ways. So by their own logic, a university could prohibit professors from addressing university students by preferred pronouns, no matter the professor's view. After all, the professors have no freedom of speech, so they can't be, they can be prohibited. And it doesn't matter their view because, you know, they don't have academic freedom. It's nothing to do with teaching, remember? It could even impose this restriction while denying professors the ability to explain why they were doing so. Yeah, can't mention it on the syllabus. Can't do that because, yep. So this is not true. While it's without sufficient justification, the state cannot wield its authority categorically to silence dissenting viewpoints. Yeah, so it's like, you know, 
be careful what for you wish for because you might get it friends and this does seem to be again this is a personal criticism but my friends on the left seem to be have this problem more and maybe it's because conservatives are naturally conservative they're more cautious but my friends on the left are like ah there's only upsides we'll increase freedom and we'll increase quality and it's like and we'll say that We'll say that professors have no freedom of speech and they can be compelled to use pronouns because, you know, it has nothing to do with teaching, has nothing to do with academic freedom. They can be compelled to say that. And some some conservative public college says, great, we're going to compel them to use the, the, the biological pronouns. They can't mention the syllabus. And you're like, wait, what? It's like, yeah, that's your rule. Maybe you want to think that all the way through next time. Thus, the academic freedom exception to our study covers classroom speech related to matters of public concern whether or not that speech is germane to the contents of the lecture or not. The need for free exchange of ideas in a college classroom is unlike that in other public workplace settings. Yeah. And a public in-class speech to his students is anything but speech by an ordinary employee. Yeah, this is, this is not like the DMV or, you know, like, you know, whatever, insert your government employee here. This is, you know, a little bit, the, the speech is a little bit more important to the job. In some senses, speech is the job. So, you know, there's that. Of course, some classroom speech falls outside this exception. A university might, for example, require teachers to call roll at the start of class, and that type of non-ideological ministerial task would not be protected by the First Amendment. Shawnee State says the rule at issue is similarly ministerial, but as we discussed below, titles and pronouns carry a message. The university recognizes that and wants professors to use pronouns to communicate the message. People can have gender identity inconsistent with their sex at birth. But Meriwether does not agree with this message and does not want to communicate it to its students. That's not a matter of like classroom management. That's a matter of pure academic speech. Yeah, even if you can make them do like ministerial attacks of like, please record your grades and please report them this way. And, you know, please report them by this date and make sure attendance or whatever. Um, this is not ministerial. This is this is communicating an idea. Let me know if you're here is not really communicating an idea. You know, uh, this is more. Yeah, this is more ideas. Although Garcetti does not bar Meriwether's free speech claim, that's not the end of the matter. We must now apply a long-standing Pickering chronic framework to determine whether Meriwether has plausibly alleged his in-class speech in -class speech was protected by the First Amendment. So, yeah, so whether or not the f First Amendment is a factor is one issue. Whether or not it rules for Meriwether in this case is, of course, a different issue. So we've determined the First Amendment is a thing. So having determined that, now that's the thing. Let's apply the thing and see how it comes out. Under the relevant framework, we asked two questions. First, was Meriwether speaking on a matter of public concern? And second, was his interest in doing so rather than the university's interest in promoting the efficiency of public services it performs through him? To determine whether speech involves a matter of public concern, we look to the content, form, and context of a given statement as revealed by the record. When speech relates to any matter of political, social, or other concern to the community, it addresses public concern. Thus, a teacher's in-class speech about race, gender, and power conflicts address matters of public concern. A basketball coach using racial epitaphs to motivate his players does not. The linchpin of the inquiry is thus, for both public concern and academic freedom, the extent to which the speech advances an idea transcending personal interest or opinion which impacts our social and political lives. Meriwether did just that in refusing to use gender identity-based pronouns. And the point of his speech, or the point of refusal, was to convey a message. Taken in context, his speech concerns a struggle over societal control of language in a crucial debate about nature and foundations or the real existence of sexes. That is, his mode of address was a message. It reflected his conviction that one's sex cannot be changed, a topic which has been the news on many occasions has become the center issue of political debate. From courts to schoolrooms, this controversy continues. Recently, the Fifth Circuit rejected an appellant's motion to be referred to by appellant's preferred gender pronouns over an emphatic dissent. And on the other side, a Texas high school generated controversy when it permitted its students to display preferred gender pronouns on their online profiles. Further examples abound. In short, the use of gender-specific titles and pronouns has produced a passionate political and societal debate. All this points to one conclusion. Pronouns can and do convey a powerful message implicating a sensitive topic that is of public concern. So yeah, pronouns is a matter of public concern as anyone with a brain and access to the news should be able to readily determine. And history does tend to repeat itself. 
Never before have titles and pronouns been scrutinized as closely as they are today for the power to validate or invalidate someone's perceived sex or gender identity. Merriweather took a side in that debate. Through his continued refusal to address Doe as a woman, he advanced a viewpoint on gender identity, which is not, you know, uh, the, you, the viewpoint that, you know, the university would like, but, you know, is a viewpoint nevertheless. And even the university appears to treat this as a hot issue. Otherwise, why would it forbid Merriweather from explaining his personal and religious beliefs about gender identity in the syllabus? No one can test Merriweather proposed to what he proposed involved a matter of public concern. So yeah, you can't say it's not a matter of public concern because you'd forbid him from putting it in your syllabus. So if it wasn't a matter of public concern, why'd you care? But you did care because it is. So, you know, yeah, it performs through its employees. We begin with a robust tradition of academic freedom in our nation's post-secondary schools. These interests are powerful. Here, the university refused to even permit Merriweather to comply with his pronoun mandate while expressing personal conviction in a syllabus disclaimer. This ban is an anthema to the principles underlying the First Amendment. As the proudest boast of our free speech jurisprudence is that we protect the freedom to express the thought that we hate. Yeah, another note to my friends on the left, this is more a left problem in th today than on the right. And I think this was definitely a problem on the right in the past. It's interesting how things change, but this is a problem on the left at the moment. Yeah, the, the whole like Berkeley free speech movement was basically because the conservatives didn't want ideas expressed and the Berkeley free speech movement was like, all the ideas should be expressed. And that's kind of the opposite way around. Now our brethren on the left are like, no, we should restrict the ideas. And the conservatives are like, no, we need to allow these ideas. So it's interesting how things change or how positions get, uh, you know, maybe it's like that you, you convinced us. It's like you, you convinced, you convinced the conservatives are conservative, but not necessarily immovable. So it's like, ah, oh, you convinced us. You convinced us freedom of speech is good. No, it's not good. Wait, what? Well, we thought it was good. We're confused. You know, we don't move on a dime over here. So, yeah. So uh, the, the idea of the First Amendment should protect ideas that you hate might be a lesson that might need to be taught a little bit more clearly to some of my brethren on the left because they don't seem to agree that free speech includes ideas that you hate. They seem to, on balance, have very negative opinions about hate speech in particular. So, yeah, maybe a little bit more clarity on that would, would be nice. And this is particularly true in the context of college classrooms where students' interest in hearing even contrarian views is at stake. Teachers and students must always remain free to inquire, to study and evaluate, and gain new maturity and understanding. On the other side of the ledger, Schwani State over here argues that it has a compelling interest in stopping discrimination against transgender students. It relies on a case called EEOC versus Paris. There, a panel of our court held that an employer violates Title Seven when it takes adverse employment action based on employees' transgender status. The panel did not, and indeed, consistent with the First Amendment, could not have held. The government always has a compelling interest in regulating free speech. So, yeah, just because you have a compelling governmental interest in one context doesn't necessarily imply in all contexts, no. If you did this, it would reduce Pickering to a shield, and it would allow universities to discipline professors, students, and staff any time their speech might cause offense. This is not the law. Purported neutral non-discrimination policies cannot be used to transform institutions of higher learning into enclaves of totalitarianism. Turning to the facts, the university's interest in punishing Meriwether's speech is comparatively weak. When the university demanded that Meriwether refer to Doe using female pronouns, Meriwether proposed a compromise. He would call on Doe using Doe's last name alone. That seems like a win-win. Meriwether would not have to violate his religious beliefs, and Doe would not be referred to using pronouns Doe finds offensive. Thus, on allegations in his complaint, it's hard to see how this would have created a hostile learning environment that ultimately forced the academic process. It's like the court's like, yeah, this should have been fine because Meriwether wins, Doe isn't referred to by an offensive name, everyone's happy, but no, for some reason. Finally, Schwani states and interveners argue that Title IX compels a contrary result. We disagree. Title IX prohibits discrimination of any educational program or activity based on sex. The requirement that discrimination occur under any educational program or activity suggests that behavior must be serious enough to have a systemic effect of denying victim equal access to educational program or activity. But Meriwether's decision to not to refer to Doe using feminine pronouns did not have this effect. As we already explained, there is no indication at this stage of the litigation that Meriwether's speech inhibited Doe's education or ability to succeed in the classroom. Okay, having turned to the freedom of speech angle on this case, we now must turn our attention to freedom of religion, which also, I'd like to remind you, is a First Amendment guarantee, which, you know, 
we have to factor it in. So let's look at how the university treated the uh, First Amendment right to freedom of religion and how that might apply. Let's read on. Meriwether next argues that as a public university, Shawnee State violated the free exercise clause when it disciplined him for not following policy. We agree. The Constitution requires the government commit itself to religious tolerance. Thus, laws that burden religious exercise are presumptively unconstitutional unless they're both general and neutrally applicable. Meriwether has plausibly alleged that Shawnee's application of its gender identity policy was not neutral for at least two reasons. First, officials at Shawnee State exhibited hostility to religious beliefs, and second, irregularities in the university's adjudication and investigative process permits a plausible inference of non-neutrality. Start with one of the individuals Meriwether alleges was involved in the action against him, the department chair, Jennifer Pauley. Meriwether came to her to discuss his religious concerns about the policy. Pauley might have responded with tolerance or at least neutral objectivity. She did not. Instead, she remarked that religion oppresses students and said that even its presence at universities is counterproductive. Christians in particular, she said, were primarily motivated out of fear. In her view, Christian doctrines should not be taught. And for good measure, she added that Christian professors should be banned from teaching courses at, on Christianity, knowing that Meriwether had done so. Is this neutral and non-hostile? No. no. No, not so much. No. Um, these kind of comments do suggest some hostility to religion, but wait, there's more. Pauly was not the only allegedly hostile actor. After Meriwether was disciplined, a union representative presented Meriwether's grievance to Provost Bow a supposedly neutral adjudicator, but Bauer, not so much. He repeatedly interrupted the union representative and made clear he went on to discuss academic freedom and religious discrimination aspects. The union representative tried to explain Meriwether's religious beliefs and the teaching of his church, but Provost Bauer responded with open laughter. And after laughter, Bauer became so cooperative that he's not able to present the grievance. Maybe some hostility to religion there. Shawnee's state director of labor relations, who was Bauer's representative, then piled on when he reviewed the grievance. In his view, Meriwether's convictions were no better and no more worthy of tolerant accommodation than religiously motivated racism or sexism. A little bit of hostility, and then the court comes up with the punchline. If this sounds familiar, it should. In Master Peak Case Shop, the Supreme Court reversed a decision of the Colorado Civil Rights Commission when the commission made hostile statements that cast a doubt on the fairness of the adjudication. The commission said that religion had been used to justify all kinds of discrimination throughout history, suggesting the defendant was using religion as a pretext for discrimination. The Supreme Court called such comments inappropriate and said the commission impartial, said they called the commission's impartiality into question. The same rationale also applies here. Meriwether respectfully sought accommodation that would protect his religious beliefs and make Doe feel more comfortable. In response, the university derided him and equated his good faith convictions with racism. An inference of religious hostility is plausible. So yeah, much like Masterpiece Cake Shop, where you know the cake shop was treated like crap in its adjudication process because religion is bad, very, very bad, very, very bad, and the Supreme Court reminded them that actually no, religion is not bad. Religion is a thing that you know you have to be neutral for and not show animus to. So much like uh, the heroes of Masterpiece Cake Shop in Colorado, our friends here in Ohio are behaving are, are behaving the same and uh you know treating it with animus and derision so maybe that's not good yeah that could be a thing while the hostility shawnee state exhibit would be enough for meriwether to claim a survival of motion dismiss there's more there's yet more he alleges that various irregularities in the university investigation and adjudicative process also permit this inference we agree not all laws that look neutral are actually neutral and therefore constitutional in what ways was the adjudicative process irregular? Well, first of all, the university alleged basis for disciplining was a moving target. The Title IX report claimed that Meriwether violated the policy by creating a hostile education environment. Dean Milken agreed and recommended discipline for hostile environment. Yet when Meriwether grieved discipline, university's officials conceded that he never created a hostile environment. Instead, the case is now suddenly about disparate treatment. But oral argument, the university changed its position once again. It's really about hostile environment. Kind of a moving target, kind of a moving goalpost on that one. These repeated changes in position, along with alleged religious hostility, permit a plausible inference the university was not applying a pre-existing policy in a neutral way, but was instead using an evolving policy in a pretext for targeting his belief. 
Like we don't need to have standards. Whatever works for them for the for the good of the order, right? Standards are bad. You know, wokeness is good. And also plausibly that the reinterpretation policy was an after the fact invention designed to justify punishing Merriweather for religiously motivated speech, not a neutral interpretation of generally applicable policy. When Dean Milken told Merriweather that he was violating the policy, Merriweather proposed a compromise. He addressed Doe using a last name and refrained from using pronouns to address Doe. This was initially accepted, but several weeks later, she retracted the agreement and demanded they use pronouns for her pronouns. Now the university claims that its policy does not permit any religious accommodation. No religious accommodation at all. Okay. Third, the university Title IX investigation raises flags. On their own, these issues might not warrant an inference of non-neutrality, but combined with allegations in the complaint, they prove a lot of circumstantial evidence of discrimination. For stars, the Title IX investigator interviewed just four witnesses, including Meriwether and Doe. She did not interview a single non-transgender student in any of Meriwether's classes, nor did she ask Meriwether to recommend any witnesses, because why would we need to? Instead, except for Meriwether and Doe, not a single witness testified about any interactions between them. Even so, Meriwether, even so, the Title IX officer concluded Meriwether created a hostile environment, despite the lack of anyone else saying, yeah, this was hostile, or observing it, or noting it in any way. Brilliant. The interveners submit that because Milken issued a written warning, and because there's no allegation that Milken harbored any animus towards Palaev's religious beliefs, Meriwether's free exercise claim must fail. Uh, why? Because the original discipline was not the product of animus, but that argument is both faulty and legally flawed. According to the flax in the complaint, Milken did not issue a warning. She recommended it, but Bauer imposed punishment and notified Mer 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 Meriwether it. And in any case, Masterpiece forecloses this argument. A disciplinary fee fee proceeding that is fair at the beginning still violates free exercise if it's influenced by religious hostilities later. Finally, the university argues that Meriwether simply could have complied with the alternative it offered him. Don't use any pronouns or sex-based terms at all. This officer, the university says, would not have violated his religious belief. But such an officer, such an officer has two problems. First, it would prohibit Meriwether from speaking in accordance with his belief that sex and gender are conclusively linked. And second, such a system would be impossible to comply with, especially in a class heavy on discussion and debate. No Mr. or Miss, no yes sir or no ma'am, no he said or she said. And when Meriwether slipped up, as he would inevitably do, especially for using these tells for the last 25 years, he could face discipline. Our rights do not hinge on this precarious balance. The effect of this Hobbesian choice is that Meriwether must adhere to the university's orthodoxy or face punishment. This is coercive, or at the very least, of an indirect sort. And we know the free exercise clause protects both the direct and indirect coercion. Thus, that brings us to the end of the case of Nicholas Meriwether versus Shawnee State University and the Sexuality and Gender Acceptance Alliance. In this case, Mr. Meriwether, I'm sorry, Dr. Meriwether, was a professor at this university and has been a professor for 25 years. He has been using tells like Mr. and Mrs. for a lot of this time, and he believes, informed by his Christian faith, that a person cannot change their gender, a person cannot change their sex, and gender and sex are, are, are un unavoidably and permanently linked. That's his belief, and he'd like to not use terms that defy that belief. And the university says, you must, you must use the terms. He says, how about a compromise? What if I use her name? or his name, or whatever. What if I use the name of the person? Because that won't be offensive because it's their name. And the university said yes, and then said no. You have to use the pronoun. And he said, uh, and then the professor said, okay, what if I use the pronouns, but I just put a note in my syllabus that this is your policy. I'm doing it because of your policy, which presumably you're super proud of. And the university said, no, you can't make note of its own policy. You can't do that. You can't do it. You can't do it at all. You have to use the pronouns. The pronouns are nothing. And then it went through various levels of appeals and they, and they inside school and it didn't go well. And the Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit says, ah, you know, university professors have freedom of speech. This is a political philosophy class. So there's that. And you can't compel someone to use speech because if you could, it would allow the exact opposite of that, which presumably the defendants here would think is bad. So the sexuality and gender acceptance people over here who are saying, ah, Freedom of speech doesn't apply, and the university should be allowed to compel it because not academic freedom, and it's not related. Apparently, the sexual and gender acceptance people would be perfectly happy by their own logic with a university going exactly the opposite way and saying you must use the biological pronouns and you can't put a disclaimer, blah blah blah. And the the, so the court of appeals points out the problem. So yeah, the First Amendment is a thing, 
The professor cannot be forced to use the pronouns that he does not like. And that brings us to the end of the discussion of this case.